As you look at that little Australian sea lion pup there, mixing it up with the New Zealanders, they normally don't like each other, they, they stay apart. You can see they're using this same rock pool to learn how to swim before they get weaned and, and go out and venture into great white shark territory. What is the rate of uh, successful predation on an adult versus one of these youngsters? Yeah, there's a, a lot more likelihood of a pup getting taken by a shark. They're only just now learning how to swim and that's why this time of the year is great for great white sharks right here. Um, pretty soon the pups are hard to catch in any sort of daylight or clear water. It's very unlikely they'll actually get caught. But, um, an adult sea lion in good conditions doesn't really have much to worry about. A lot of people, you know, picture the seal as this helpless, cute animal, but in reality the adult is quite large and could do some damage to the shark, right? And the yeah, adult fur seals and sea lions have these big canine teeth and uh, formidable predators and you have to be on your game to uh, take them on seriously as a great white shark. But, um, the pups are quite small and uh, juicy little parcels and uh, they're easy supper. That's why the white sharks like this time of the year. It's a lot easier for the sharks to target the pups. There's less damage to the to the sharks and uh, a lot easier to catch. So the energy reward equation goes way in the favour of the shark. Some days you see predations all day long in the right visibility water and cloud cover and the right sharks on their game. But then sometimes you go weeks without even seeing a predation here. But yeah, most of the predations usually happen around dawn or or dusk. And uh, interestingly, you see the white sharks cruising along the shoreline and all the pups following it in the shallows, just out of reach of the shark. And then you can see the shark turn around and the, and the pups all scatter away. So there's a lot of game playing and the seals are fully aware of the sharks in this area. When a predation does happen, do, does any of that stuff hold true about them trying to decapitate in one shot or go for a uh, back fin, any of those stories, or is it just try and get hold? Yeah, these sea lions are so maneuverable that the shark's great speed will outrun it, but it tries just to have a, a mortal blow on the first bite uh, to kill the animal. So, yeah, a big tear or a decapitation would certainly be the end of the seal's day. And then the shark will move off and let it bleed out, or will it pursue yeah. immediately? Yeah. In the case of uh, sea lions and fur seals, uh, a typical behaviour is the shark to grab the, the, the seal or the seal pup and take it down and drown it straight away and uh, bleed it out and that's, that's game over for the seal in that case. Do, in that scenario, does the shark sometimes lose its kill to a bigger shark that moves in? Yeah. It looks like there's a whole dominance social hierarchy of, of sharks. Usually it's the biggest shark is the boss. The little sharks make way, but they're opportunistic. They work on the confusion principle of other sharks in the area. And it's great to see uh, the big sharks taking uh, dominance in the pattern around the boat. But uh, when predation comes around, yeah, the big one normally takes priority in the, in the patrolling location, but the little ones will certainly opportunistically take a prey that escapes or any shrapnel left over. Have you ever witnessed cooperative feeding, such as on a whale carcass or something of that sort? Yeah, it, when I've seen uh, multiple sharks feeding on a whale carcass, there seems to be a pecking order there too, where the big ones will always have right of way over the smaller ones, and that's just a size thing. But did they ever get uh, nippy with each other, or was it a pretty peaceable feeding? Yeah. Yeah, at times when sharks are competing for, for space or for food, um, the big ones will line up against the smaller ones, and you normally see the, the smaller one will, will give way generally, as a rule, and uh, the big one takes over the dominance of the pattern formation around that, that prey item. Natalie Banks captured some interesting footage that she's going to share with me. Can you describe what we're seeing in that footage? Is that with the two sharks coming yeah. together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw an image of, of Natalie Banks where two sharks came together 
and um, I'm not sure the little one saw the big one coming, but it, it resulted in both of them coming up out of the water in a, in a spectacular image. And um, certainly the little one would be best to get out of the way of the big shark in that case. What was the aftermath? Was there serious damage or not really? So I, all I saw was a blurry picture uh, on Facebook. Right. <laughs> That's no all I've got. I had no idea about anything else. You've seen white sharks intentionally beach themselves on the rocks trying to get yeah. the seals? Yeah, deep in this bay here where all the seal pups are, you get white sharks cruising real shallow, waist tight water and the seals follow them along right next to the rocks and um, it's a real cat and mouse game. It's, it is surprising how shallow white sharks come into this little bay here to predate on the first, first seal pups. Yeah, the, the white sharks can get into the shallows but once the seal pups uh, get right back into the shallow water with the rocks and the weed, they're pretty safe from predation and they know uh, just how to keep just out of range of the white sharks patrolling, patrolling zone here. So hunting seals on the rocks isn't really a hunting behavior. They just happen to get on the rocks during hunting. Yeah, yeah I think um, sometimes I've seen white sharks hunt the, the, the seals right up against the rocks and I'm sure there's been contact of white sharks with the rocks. And the scratches that we see on some of these white sharks show that they do penetrate into that real intertidal zone at times and um, I'm sure they scratch themselves on the rocks at times in there. As an ecotourism operator, obviously you find value in ecotourism. However, what concerns you about the ecotourism industry or what might become of the ecotourism industry? Yeah, yeah I think ecotourism with great white sharks is a fantastic thing. It's got to be kept in balance though. People got to realize that these sharks are a limited uh, resource for tourism and welfare of the sharks should be paramount. We should look after the sharks, not over, over utilize them, uh, be gentle with them, treat them with respect and uh, at the same time be aware that they're a very dangerous animal at the same time and not take, be blasé about engaging them. Uh, just as far as I think there's a lot to be said of, of a few people free swimming with, with great whites now showing, giving the message that they're not the dangerous mindless killers that people once thought. But at the same time also it could give the wrong message that they're not dangerous predators at the same time. So I think we've got to be careful uh, if, if people continue to do that somebody's going to get hurt and it'll probably be the shark's fault then and uh, that's not, not the real thing at all. With the recent study um, based on the Neptune Islands saying that this uh, ecotourism actually has caused them to stay in their area a little bit longer, say changing their behavior, how do you uh, react um, in part to something like that? Yeah, we uh, absolutely support any research that looks at behavioural pattern changes of sharks in the areas where ecotourism takes place. And we would look to minimise that and take a precautionary principle not to change their behaviour. They've got natural migration routes, they need to be here to provision to move on and live their life cycle. So I think it's really important that we continue to monitor all the white shark biology in this area the way we act. So if they concluded that you needed to chop a couple of months off of your business, would you think that that was reasonable or would you give them a counter suggestion? Yeah, yeah I'm very happy that we've capped the level of our activity here in this, uh, the Neptune Islands area. We've got a limit on the number of days that we can work and the number of operators that can engage the white sharks. I think that will actually help uh, not cause any bad changes in their behavior that could lead to the you know the health of the population is, is the most important of all here. And something we talked about earlier offline is the uniqueness of the Neptune Islands and the fact that you get such a wide range of sizes and ages at the same time. Any, yeah. I know it's speculation but do you have yeah. any theories? Yeah. Yeah, the Neptune Islands is unique in that we have a whole range of different size sharks coming 
here throughout the year, different populations of males and females and uh, even at the same time here. Um, that's got to do with uh, seal breeding seasons and it's on the pathway of migration routes for other food sources up and down the Gulf at certain depth ice climbs. Uh, this is where snapper run in and out of the Gulfs. We've also got a couple of different seal species that breed outside of uh, a normal annual pattern. That means we're getting sharks here that are regular every year at the same time and sometimes they come several times a year. Yeah, I think it's important that ecotourism operations like cage diving get people to actually see the white shark in its natural environment. That's how you can understand it, you know, want to protect it. That's how conservation works. Oh, I know it. An obvious one. You guys have been doing this for so long, and there's yeah. this concept of numbers of white sharks increasing and recovering. What have you seen in terms of numbers? Have you, is, yeah. is it, are you able to detect a pattern? Yeah. Yeah. Over the decades, we've actually seen a, a pretty good increase in numbers in the last 10 years or so at the Neptune Islands. Some years they go away, but. Um, that's actually a, a good thing uh, for great white shark biology, I think. Yeah, it's just not right. They weren't, grew, they weren't brought up on the fishing boats to know nah, how you do stuff. Yeah. It's still watching me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I saw a decent sized shark with, what was that, an external acoustic on it? Yeah, uh, today we had um, Big Narky and he's got an acoustic tag. He uh, is getting closer and closer and um, is not, not really a shy shark, but he's not fast, he's just deliberate. Good, good shark to take photos of. Yeah. What have you learned about him from the uh, tag? Yeah, oh, Naki's been around for a few years now. He's, he's the sort of shark that stays around for a week or two, moves away. You might see him again for a little session before, not again until next year. Um, he also pops up at the South Neptune Islands, which is only about six miles away. And um, I don't know where he goes uh, outside of the Neptunes the rest of the year. We don't have a satellite tracker on him, so he comes and goes during the day. I think he's got his pattern of predation with the seals and then when he clocks off he comes and says hello to us. Just had that small three metre female join us. In close. Now we need those big boys. You've learned a lot about sharks over the years. Yeah. Now, from the acoustic data here, what's the most interesting thing you learned about the movements of the sharks? Just from the acoustic tags. Yeah, from the acoustic tags, we can tell the absence and presence of the sharks on a daily, weekly, seasonal and yearly basis. We've got two, two sharks that are acoustically tagged here now, uh, signalling on our receivers is uh, Roger Ramjet and we've got Naki. And they seem to arrive at the same time each day, we think they might sort of have the same pattern of activity. After they patrol for seals, they come on into the bay and they clock off and that's when we tend to see them. Is it ridiculous to think that they're buddies? Yeah, everything we know about these sharks shows that they, they don't sort of hunt like a wolf pack, but they move together and I wouldn't be surprised if they know each other really well. Um, they cross paths a lot during the season across the year. In uh, 40 years, of your work. How about uh, your satellite tags? What's the most interesting movement of these sharks that you've tagged from here that you learned? Yeah, originally our satellite tag data showed sharks traveling all the way up to Northwest Australia and even uh, up the east coast of Australia, uh, less what. But our, uh, just recently we've had a, a great result, a big super female, probably the biggest shark ever tagged. Uh, we've tracked her out into the southern ocean, way off the shelf, diving to over a thousand meters deep. And that's new for Australia and that fills in the, the gaps of the jigsaw puzzle that match up with uh, the Pacific data and the Atlantic data and off South Africa. And when you say one of the biggest sharks, people that don't know how big these get, what are we talking? Roughly. 
Yeah, big dolly, one of the, the biggest shark I think that's ever been satellite tagged is approaching six meters long or uh, nearly 20 foot long. She's a real super mature What's giant. What's that convert to in weight? Yeah. Uh, a big near six meter shark like Dolly would be approaching 2,000 kilograms and, and it would certainly go over two tons of weight when she's fully gravid. And I noticed that you don't use spot tags. Is there a specific reason for that? Yeah, we don't like to invade the sharks uh, with spot tags here at the Neptune Islands. The pat tags are less invasive and we select the sharks we use uh, to answer specific questions. But uh, we don't want to catch these sharks, we, we love these sharks and we think that's unnecessary to invade that. So you think that you might be doing some harm to the shark by catching them? Or? Yeah, yeah. By, by catching the sharks to put the spot tags on the dorsal, you're certainly going to upset the whole social hierarchy. We don't want to disturb the sharks at this special area. Um, also, um, the spot tags do tend to damage the dorsal fin of the shark and it's uh, not necessary to do that when you can just tag a, a pat tag, satellite tag, uh, freely into the shark as it's swimming past the platform. It's a, it's a lot less invasive and uh, you get the same data Plus the advantages of uh, depth and temperature data with the archival tags that the, the pat tag advantages are. So a lot of people just think this is a big, really tough animal that you don't really have to worry about damaging it. Can you, yeah. dumb, it, can you dumb it down for us? How, how does it affect their hierarchy like you just mentioned? Even though great white sharks are big tough sharks, uh, they've got quite a fragile social system and uh, interestingly we've seen even when one shark in the social structure of an area has been upset, sometimes we see a mass exodus of sharks from the area. And that's been seen when killer whales invade the area or when a shark has been caught or killed. And when you just mess around with them, they, they clear out of the area. And um, even a big tough shark, um, if it's stressed, um, it can be a real fine balance out there in nature, you know, we're, they're on the edge, predator-prey relationships are finely tuned and if you stress out a big predator, it can tip the balance away and, and that shark can struggle to survive. Describe the bottom cage behavior that you saw today. Yeah, the first dive was a bit slow, we had three sharks a bit standoffish, but my second cage dive, they were all over us. We had three sharks uh, at the cage at once, point blank, uh, a, a small female, a big boy, Gilly, haven't seen him for a few years, and big uh, Roger was zooming through over the top as well, fantastic stuff. And there's no, we're not dragging any bait down there, so they're actually just curious about what you are, taking a look or what? Yeah, down on the bottom the sharks are a little bit more at home and intimate and they I uh, don't need to rush it baits, they just cruise around and uh, they're at home on the bottom down there. Do you have a favorite out of 40 years? Is there one shark that stands out in your mind? Yeah, after um, a few years of seeing the same shark, uh, I often find that they become my favorite for a little while. I guess if I was to look back over the years, um, Moo is, is my favourite. He's been around the longest, he's got spots, he's got character. Um, a big beautiful shark called Tinker was a, a powerful female for, for about five years and she was gorgeous. Um, and Johnny was an old long favourite of mine as well. He's, he's gone now for a few years but I still haven't forgotten Johnny. How sad would you be if you found out that the uh, Western Australian government called Johnny? Yeah, well this is the thing, I seem to get attached to these sharks, I seem to, I get them a personality that may be my perception of them, but they're all different animals, and if uh, a shark that I knew it got killed, it would be like losing a member of my family nearly, you know, they're, they're like a really uh, a fond pet, and um, even though I don't know if they know me, I get to know them by looking at them day after day, year after year. Are you ever tempted to think that they do recognize you? Yeah, I'm, I'd like to think that they do recognize me. I, uh, I, they may uh, cue into familiar sounds of the boat or cages, but um, I'm sure they're just as likely to uh, investigate and be curious about any other 
new person or cage or boat in their area. You described uh, something really interesting in a change in behavior from one of your really famous sharks, uh, Jumbo. And what, what changed with her? Yeah, we, we've known Big Jumbo for six or seven years now. Um, she's been a formidable shark, um, and uh, certainly a shark you don't want to be caught at unawares with. Uh, this year, however, she has uh, had uh, love bites all over her. We think she's pregnant from mating scars, and um, it looks like her behaviour's changed. She's sort of delicate and fluffy and docile, and I can't see the same sort of level of danger as I normally do with, with Big Jumbo. And when you perceive danger, what are some things that she does outside the cage that would make you feel like you shouldn't get out? Yeah, yeah Jumbo seems to be dangerous. She approaches head on and she, um, she seems to be more dangerous because she changes her speed and looks at you and you can see some sort of intelligence in, in her head. It's not just a shark circling around with a big lifeless black eye. She, she looks curious right at you. So as attached as to these sharks as you may get, you haven't lost sight of the fact that they will cause you harm. Yeah, that's the thing you need to remember. You sometimes get a little bit blasé about the same sharks moving around and around you, the ones you know. But you've got to remember they're wild animals, they're powerful predators and they deserve a lot of respect. Have you had one try to give you a kiss before? Yeah, I've got working in really close range to get the, the photographs um, to fill the wide angle frames. You know, you, you sometimes you've got to remember they can react very quickly. They're not necessarily out to attack you, but you don't want to get in front of something that big and heavy with those big teeth. Yeah. Now, I, I've gotten the press impression from your dad and from you that you guys are really in it for the animals. And uh, I asked you a little bit about uh, this study that came out that said that maybe this is affecting their behavior. And you seemed pretty open to hearing about it. What What is your feeling about all of that? Yeah, the, the studies that show that um, behavioral changes can occur from um, shark cage diving activities is something we're very interested in and we very much want to monitor that. Uh, interestingly, we're seeing a negative habituation with a lot of the long-term sharks to become less interested in us and the boat the longer exposure they have to us. And that's all an energy balance of reward for effort. They tend to give up and go away and uh, if uh, they're, not, they're not being fed by responsible operators it looks like they'll uh, actually shy away from cage diving. Yeah, I heard you tell your deckhand that not a single piece of bait was allowed to be lost. Yeah, absolutely. We pride ourselves on uh, getting people uh, fantastic images and uh, sharks presented for research, but uh, not at the expense of deliberately feeding them. We try to avoid any sort of contact of the sharks with the cages of the platform or feeding them or any sort of circus act behavior. What's the best, most concise analogy or argument that you can give to people who have this perception that you are teaching sharks to eat people? Yeah, the first thing people should know about uh, the chances of conditioning sharks to eat people is first of all, just look at the shark attack record. And we can see just that this carefully compiled, it's accurate, and there seems to be no relationship between cage diving and shark attacks. Uh, there's no link, no evidence, and any evidence that we do have shows negative habituation towards sharks and people after exposure to shark cage diving activities. All right, I'll give so enough of my questions. How about from an ecotourism operator who's attached to these animals? What's an important message that you would like me to convey? Yeah. There's real value in uh, cage diving ecotourism. This is the platform that funds us to get out and do the research on great white sharks. Uh, not only that, we can appreciate the animal, uh, uh, we'll get people to want to conserve it, to get the images that make the world want to protect this shark. Without, without that happening, people wouldn't care about the sharks. 
So it's an important role to get people to see this real wild animal in nature. Green Park, mate.